Hey everyone, thanks for coming out uh, for this presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, also a big thanks to Mike uh, and everyone who helped make this event possible. It's super exciting for me to be able to talk with you about Gettysburg Faces, per Portraits and Personal Accounts, uh, which is a new book. And um, uh, although it oftentimes seems like uh, it's a single author at work, it really is the product of a large community of helpful folks and you, uh, the members of the audience and those who are interested in learning about Civil War history. So I'm going to talk to you tonight uh, about the book, and um, uh, I want to also give you a little bit of a primer about photography, and I also want to talk a little bit about uh, the research. So let's jump in. Uh, all of you know this. There's many, many ways to tell the Gettysburg story. You can look at it through the lens of the battles. You can talk about the leaders. You can talk about individual units, whether they're regiments, brigades, corps. Uh, you can talk about it through the perspective of the casualties. You can talk about the citizens who are in Gettysburg or in the surrounding areas of Pennsylvania. You can talk about it through the monuments, all of the post-war period, the rich history of the monuments that were erected. You can also talk about it through the battlefield photographs. Now, I wanna tell the story of Gettysburg in a slightly different way. Um, I wanna look at it through portrait photographs, Civil War portrait photographs, and not just any photographs. I wanna look at it through the lens of identified people whose stories have been forgotten or somehow have escaped notice over time. Now, this idea is not necessarily new. Um, it's not original. Uh, when I first started my work as an author more than 20 years ago, I came across this quote by the eminent uh, British historian Thomas Carlyle in his 1870 book, Past and Present. He says, history is the essence of innumerable biographies. Uh, that always, always touched me. Uh, and I always thought about, about that. And I wasn't alone. If you go into 19th century county and city, city history books, uh, that period of time as local historians are going back and uh, looking at um, how their areas came to be, a number of them riff off of Carlyle's statements. And perhaps not surprisingly, they include a healthy section, sometimes a completely separate volume that are dedicated to biographies of those townspeople who helped make the area what it is. Now, I'm not immune from doing my own riff on Carlisle's statement. And my version of it is the history of the Civil War is the portraits and stories of its soldiers, sailors, excuse me, sailors and civilians. Now, I want to be clear, um, I'm not talking about the unknown portraits, uh, those iconic images like this one here of the three Confederate prisoners at Gettysburg that were seen during the war. Uh, this image was taken in July of 1863. Um, during the war, it was published um, and has been seen ever since then in various pictorial histories and elsewhere. I'm not talking about this, those images. They are in a class um, to themselves. What I'm interested in, in is those identified portraits that have been tucked away in albums. Um, they've been on top of a fireplace hearth um, on a bookshelf. Uh, these are images that were never intended for the public. Um, these were just for uh, individuals and their families to enjoy and appreciate. So this takes me to want to talk a little bit about um, this section I'm calling 
Portraits 101, because as you're looking through the book, or if you're online, or, or however you're consuming Civil War photography, when you're looking at these portraits, um, I think it's helpful to get a sense of what you're actually seeing. So there's really two major types of formats that were available during the Civil War period to soldiers and to the rest of the population. Uh, the first uh, is the hard plate images, daguerreotypes, ambrotypes, tintypes. You may know some of those names. Those of you who are collectors definitely know them. Um, but if you're new to the Civil War or not particularly versed in photography, um, I, I would be, um, I would imagine that you probably have heard the term tintypes and you may know daguerreotypes and ambrotypes. Um, these images were uh, rather unique because they were single images that were artisanal. Um, these were very personal, very personal. Uh, and giving a hard plate portrait to a, uh, a family member, to a friend was a personal and an intimate gesture because they were made on metal or glass these one-of-a-kind objects that were in beautiful cases and they were small um, were just personal by their physical nature. I want to share this quote with you. It comes from uh, Don Keyes of Art Journal. Uh, I think this captures the spirit of these images. Uh, Don says, the images were easily carried on one's person and comfortably fitted into the hand. The lateral reversal Keep in mind, this period in photography, they made it a mirrored image. So uh, it was the reverse of what you saw. The lateral reversal of the picture meant that the image was familiar only to the sitter. That is, this mirror image as seen by him and only him or her. So basically, I'm giving you my reflection when I give you a daguerreotype, an ambrotype, or a tintype. That's a unique, I'm giving you my reflection. That's powerful. Now, I'm going to contrast that with paper photographies, uh, paper, excuse me, paper photographs. Um, those are um, albumin prints. Um, this is slick paper coated with egg whites. And the most format, most popular format is the carte de visite or card photograph, a French import that arrives coincident with the start of the Civil War. These images are more social. Uh, they're meant to be shared. There's a great quote here from the Encyclopedia of 19th Century Photography by John Hannity. And John describes in this way. He says they're small ephemeral commodities which were widely available, easy to hold, easy to pass around, easy to look over by the dozen within a drawing room. Touchy-feely artifacts, not to be looked at with deferential awe, but cataloged and collected, gossiped and commented upon. This is social media. Uh, this is the Facebook of the 1860s. So now I want to give you a little bit of a sense of um, how those two formats, the hard plate images and the paper images, uh, were popularized during the war. So as you see in this bar chart, um, the green, the gold, and the blue bars represent the hard plates. And as you can see, they're in decline as the war is going on. The CDVs, or carts de visite, or paper photographs, those images are rising in popularity. So we're really seeing the end of the era of hard plates and the beginning of the era of paper photographs. So personal images, a little bit on the decline, social images on the way up. And so it goes. A very exciting time as the Civil War is if you are a photographer working with the different formats of photography. Now, a little uh, hint, um, when we get to the section where I share stories, um, I've listed whether they're a paper or a plate, so you can get an idea in your mind uh, if it might have been given as a personal gift to give you that reflection or more of a social gift to share with all of your friends.
So I also want to talk about why did they pose this way? It's, it's, it's an important question, and I think it will help you understand as you're looking at the photographs. The obvious, the most obvious one, I think most people would guess, is the technology. Um, exposure times, there are maybe 15 to 30 seconds by the Civil War. Uh, that's still a lot of time, and you can't really be spontaneous, though people did try. Imitation is a classic. You reenact what you see if you're looking at um, books of uh, political and military movers and shakers uh, who are carefully posed in portraits, uh, as George Washington is here. That's what you copy because that's what you've seen and that's what you know. Another way to come at to answer this question, to come at it, is to think about the eyes, the lens of the photographer. The photographer, think of the photographer during the Civil War period as your doctor. Your doctor tells you what to do and you listen. Um, there is no better doctor of photography during the Civil War period than Marcus Aurelius Root. Um, he thinks of photography as an art form. He himself started out as an artist. So he thinks in that way. Um, in 1864, he wrote a book which amounts to a handbook for photographers and buried inside of that book is his six tips for an artful portrait. I'm going to share them with you uh, and I'm boiling down paragraphs and pages of dense Victorian language into a couple of quick hits for you. So number one, the figure should be off center. You don't want to have it in the center because it's too static. Number two, the distance between the lens and the figure should be greater than the figure and the backdrop. So you want to have some space around your figure. The distance between the top and the bottom should not be equal. That is to say, you want more space at the top because it makes people look taller. Number four, the figure should be composed in an engaging manner. This young boy looking off camera, uh, dressed in a uniform, uh, one arm propped up on the chair that's sitting sideways, he's at an angle. That is a dynamic pose. It's not your standard, just sitting straight forward. Number five, the figure should be lit at a 45 degree angle. Look at the light source coming from the upper left. You can see one side of his face is lighter than the other. Um, the dark shadows on the other side, it creates contrast. It gives him a three dimensional feel to his face. That's, let's face it, it's more realistic, it's more human. And number six, when all else fails, keep it simple. Um, He's sitting here looking at the camera, capturing his expression. He's got some interesting equipment, his canteen, uh, his musket. Um, it's not a complicated image. It's more of a documentarian's image, a documentarian's portrait. So yet another way to answer the question, think about it in terms of personal style. Uh, Austin Sundstrom, who did a study on this subject in 2020, came up with two ways to define personal style. The first one is a restrained style. These individuals, according to Austin, put a value on faith, family, and business success. Um, they are posed in a more quiet manner. They uh, it's almost more reflective. It's more quiet. Um, you can see here that this officer happens to be cradling his sword. It's not in the center. It's to the side, gradually sloping um, down and outside of the picture. He's looking at the camera. The emphasis is on him. Compare that with the martial view, the exact opposite. These individuals their style is to embrace physical domination. There is no question that this young man here is wanting you to see all of the weapons that he could possibly carry. And I believe if you count them up, there's at least four. There may be a couple of others tucked away in there that we can't see. Um, but all those weapons, he's got them literally framing his face. 
Uh, and of course, on the table next to him is his hardy hat with the cavalry sabers and the plume. So there's no question the, the forefront of this image is the weapons and the hats connected with his military service. Now, I do want to touch on the research. Uh, I'm calling this section Stories 101. Um, I, it is my belief that the modern research tools that we have today um, make the kind of personal storytelling possible when it would have been extremely difficult, almost impossible to do um, in the pre-digital age. Um, over the recent years, the emergence of Ancestry.com, uh, Fold3, Newspapers.com, uh, the Internet Archive, Google Books, Find a Grave, and other sites have made research available at the click uh, of a mouse or a button or the scroll of your phone. Uh, it's amazing how these sites have leveraged information. Uh, not only have they leveraged it, they've digitized it, they've made it searchable. Um, so if you can imagine a researcher in the pre-digital age, if you're researching a particular soldier from a regiment uh, in a state, you would probably try to find that person's hometown newspaper uh, and go find the microfilm and read through and see if you can find it. Um, your chances of actually finding something are really up to the number of hours and you would spend uncounted hours finding this information. Now, you can go onto newspapers.com and assuming that the newspaper is there, uh, you can find information. You can also find details of the soldier's life in other newspapers, places you would never have thought to look, um, maybe because a member of his family moved away and lived in a completely different town, um, or a comrade who moved away wrote the story of, ex of his experience in his local newspaper. So um, there's a whole wild world out there of research to be tapped into that folks just haven't really um, been exposed to before. So the, the, the bottom line here is by using all these resources, you can make uh, these individuals, whether they're a private, a corporal, a sergeant, a lieutenant, a captain, a nurse, uh, you can make them come alive again. The amount of information is astounding. And I haven't even touched on the government records that are available through the National Archives, military service records, pension files, and other documents. So um, another factor here, and particularly germane to this book, is the community of Civil War portrait photograph collectors. Uh, they uh, have been absolutely amazing um, because they think of themselves largely as caretakers, uh, keepers of history, who realize the importance of these images. Um, they're holding them for a small amount of time and then passing them on to another collector uh, for future generations to enjoy. Uh, as the editor of Military Images Magazine, and I've got some examples uh, here on the screen for you to see. It's particularly helpful because the magazine, since its founding in 1979, has been uh, the place for Civil War portrait photography collectors and others who are interested um, to showcase, to interpret, and to preserve these images. And so um, since I've been editor, uh, and that's uh, beginning in 2013, um, I have dedicated one issue, uh, the summer issue, to um, feature a feature about Gettysburg. And so over the last eight years, I've been able to publish more than 150 identified wartime images of soldiers and others connected with the battle. So the uh, photographs and the preliminary research that I did over that period of eight years um, helped me to select 100 of what 
I think are the very best stories that really help tell uh, the larger story of the campaign. So um, on this slide, you'll see, I think there's about 80 or 85 um, images that I was able to plot on uh, a map, a 1910 map of the battlefield. And uh, you can see uh, each red dot um, marks uh, a location where a soldier had a particular experience. And it's no surprise that they're clustered uh, around the main action on days one, day two, and day three. Um, another 15 or 20 images um, are not able to be pictured on this map because this book covers the entire campaign um, from in June and into July and later in July. And so um, some of those dots are off this map. But I do want to give you a sense that there is a through line here that you can take those innumerable biographies that Carlisle talks about and um, plot them on a map. And lo and behold, you have a story about the Gettysburg campaign. So um, my, my goal in doing this project um, was exactly that. Um, can I tell a coherent and cohesive story with a through line about the Gettysburg campaign through the portraits and the personal accounts? Well, I think I did, I, and I'm pretty excited about it. Um, so what I wanted to do now is um, I want to take you through um, a, a handful of photographs um, and some very, very brief summaries of that individual's experience during the Gettysburg campaign. I hope that it will uh, give you some sense of the humanity um, and some sense of the battle history. And so um, here we go. And I should also mention before we start, um, keep, uh, keep a lookout for the plate or the paper reference um, in the lower right-hand corner, because that will give you a sense of uh, the purpose of that photograph. So here we go. Jeb Stewart's cavalry and artillery screened the Army of Northern Virginia as it marched north. Union cavalry patrols discovered Stewart's forces on June 21st at a crossroads near Upperville, Virginia. In the clash that followed, a Union cannon shot struck Charlie Saunders in the leg above the knee. Medical help did not arrive in time. Charlie would never know of the momentous battle at another crossroads town in Pennsylvania. Fears for the safety of 500 patients at the military hospital in York, Pennsylvania grew as the Confederate invasion progressed. One of the hospital stewards, Al Cheney, organized 400 of the ambulatory patients into a battalion. On June 28th, as General Jubal Early's corps descended on York, the 400 patients marched to safety. Cheney stayed behind with the remaining 100 men who were not mobile. He loaded them into wagons and ambulances and led them out of harm's way. As Captain Erastus Clark and his men camped about five miles south of Gettysburg, a teenaged boy showed up and volunteered to fight the Rebs. Clark and others were suspicious of the boy's motives, but soon realized he was Union loyal. They scrounged up a blue coat, cap, musket, and equipment for the boy, and he joined Clark's company. The next day, the regiment suffered heavy casualties along Oak Ridge. The long list of severely wounded included Clark and the boy. Isaac Maul and his comrades wore bucktails on their caps as a constant reminder that much was expected from them in battle. The first bucktail regiment organized a year earlier had won laurels for its combat abilities. It also inspired the organization of the second bucktail brigade, including the 149th Infantry. Mull marched into Gettysburg carrying his musket and the weight of the bucktail reputation. 
he did his job and it cost him his life along the fearsome ridge. As Mike Link and his regiment fought along the ridge near the Lutheran seminary, a bullet struck him in the right side of his head and passed all the way through. He remembered seeing the rebel flag waving in front of him before darkness overtook him. When surgeons finally examined him 11 days later, they told him what he already knew. He would never see again. A soldier recalled seeing Anna Etheridge in uniform and on horseback as she directed care of the wounded near the Trostle House. The soldier noted, quote, she was cool and self-possessed and did not seem to mind the fire. Another soldier saw her that day and he observed, quote, I remember the wounded crying for water and that noble woman, Anna Etheridge, trying to alleviate their sufferings. I have seen her under fire riding along as unconcerned as the headquarters staff. Recent German immigrant Ernst Miller and his fellow Minnesotans paid a premium in blood to buy precious minutes to slow advancing Confederates and bring up Union reinforcements. 82% of the 262 upper Midwest boys became casualties, including Miller, who suffered a debilitating gunshot wound in his right thigh. In battle for the first time, Ben Campbell led his company into a storm of artillery and musket fire and crossed low ground sloping up towards a triangular field and beyond it, the Union front line. As he spurred his Texans forward, a bullet struck him in the chest. Ben would have celebrated his 22nd birthday the next day. After the Battle of Chancellorsville, Lucius Larrabee knew he would be killed in his next fight. Two months later at Gettysburg, he handed off his watch and other possessions to fellow officers. As they all hurried into line along Little Round Top, Lucius turned to one of the officers and said, goodbye, Billy, I shall never see you again. He did not. George Hancock and his fellow artillerists in Parker's Virginia Battery went into action early on the third day of the battle and worked their guns till early evening. When the guns fell silent, they counted 1,142 rounds fired across the day. George suffered a minor wound at some point during the action. After Pickett's charge began, U.S. Signal Corpsman Corman at General Meade's headquarters deemed the position unsafe, packed up their equipment, and withdrew. One man, Davis Castle, refused to abandon his post. Without a signal flag, he improvised one with a pole and a bedsheet. With this makeshift banner, he sent dispatches as enemy artillery fire continued to roar around him, and he remained in position until it subsided. An aide to Brigadier General Lewis Armistead at Gettysburg, Ben Hawthorne, accompanied his superior officer into Pickett's charge. The general did not return. Ben suffered a gunshot wound in the left arm and somehow, somehow he managed to make his way back across the field, littered with dead and dying men. 50 years later, at the Blue and Gray reunion in 1913, he reenacted the very same charge. Hearing a groan come from a dead cart after the battle, a soldier found John Chase regaining consciousness. The stunned soldier gave John a drink of water. His first words were, did we win the battle? After learning the answer, he was transported to surgeons who treated his missing arm, damaged eye, and 48 separate shrapnel wounds. As she rode in an ambulance through Gettysburg, 
nurse Hattie Dada saw firsthand a town dealing in the aftermath of a mass casualty event. She said, quote, nearly every house had the red hospital flag and here and there were stacks of guns which had been gathered from the battlefield off at the left of the road in the edge of the woods could be seen the newly made graves of those who had fallen. Hattie preferred field work over city hospitals and she soon got plenty of it. Susie Hare lived in Gettysburg and helped wounded Union soldiers hold up in the Adams County Courthouse. Jacob Gundrum, a German born musician, lent a hand wherever and whenever he could, and later played tunes with his brigade band to cheer wounded and sick soldiers somewhere in the death and dying. Jacob and Susie met and fell in love. The courtship ended in marriage, children, and a lifetime together. So there you have it. That's a snapshot, a sampling of Gettysburg faces, a little bit about the stories, uh, how they came together, about the photography. I hope you enjoyed it. I appreciate having the chance to talk with all of you this evening.